You stand in the garage, looking at the generator you traded three weeks of food and two working batteries for. It purrs like a mechanical cat, burning through gasoline at 0.8 gallons per hour. You did the math. With your 200-gallon reserve, you have 10 days of power. Then you notice the small metal bracket that holds the fuel line has started to corrode. It's a stamped steel part, held by two machine screws, coated in cheap zinc plating. The zinc has already peeled away in the damp air of the shelter, exposing raw steel to rot. You ask around the camp for a replacement and learn that this part is difficult to find. The scavengers want 60 rounds of ammunition for a piece of bent metal worth pennies. You think about drilling a new hole and fabricating something, but you don't own a welder. You don't know the difference between mild steel and high carbon steel and tool steel. You cannot identify metal by looking at a spark pattern or feeling its weight or cold. This is the part where physics starts laughing because you just became a technological orphan. Your great grandfather could repair a tractor with a hammer and a coal forge in a barn. He understood that iron plus carbon plus heat plus time equals steel with specific crystalline structures. He knew which woods burned hot enough to smelt which burned clean, which made good charcoal. He could read the color of heating metal. Black heat, blood red, cherry red, orange, yellow, white. Each color represented a specific temperature range that determined what you could do to the metal. At cherry red, around 1400 degrees Fahrenheit, you could forge mild steel without cracking it. At yellow, around 2000 degrees, you could forge weld two pieces into a single continuous structure. He died in 1972, and you never asked him to teach you a single thing. Now his knowledge is buried in a grave while you stand helpless in front of broken machines. Modern society before the collapse gave you complexity in exchange for your skills, and you signed that contract eagerly. When one link broke, the entire chain stopped, and the generator you traded your supplies for has become a lifeless failure monument. It sits there, 800 pounds of aluminum and copper and steel, completely inert and useless. But you could have learned to work the metals that were already here, sitting in junkyards. Every abandoned car contains 60 pounds of steel that could be reforged into tools and brackets. Steel is not a single substance, it is a spectrum of iron-carbon alloys with different properties. Mild steel has 0.05% to 0.25% carbon and bends without breaking. High carbon steel has 0.6% to 1.5% carbon and holds a sharp edge. If you heat high carbon steel to 1500 degrees and quench it in oil, you create martensite. Martensite is a crystalline structure so hard it will shatter like glass if you drop it. If you then temper it at 400 degrees for two hours, you relieve the internal stresses. Now you have a blade that holds an edge for years and flexes without snapping under load. A blacksmith from the 1800s knew this through observation and transmitted heat and color and sound. In timeline 34C, a community of 200 people has 12 months of stockpiled food. Their solar panels are working, their water filtration is functional, their perimeter is secured and monitored. On day 47, the bearing in their well pump seizes because the lubricant degraded unexpectedly. It's a specialized ceramic bearing designed for submersible pumps, 3 eighths of an inch by 7 eighths inch. They search their supplies and find they have no replacement because who stockpiles obscure pump bearings? One engineer suggests they could make a bronze bushing using a casting method remembered from before the collapse. They have no bronze, no crucible, no furnace, and no one who has ever cast metal. They attempt to melt copper pennies using a propane torch in a steel can lined with cement. The cement explodes from thermal shock at 600 degrees, sending shrapnel through a survivor's forearm. By day 90, they are hauling water in buckets from a contaminated creek half a mile away. By day 112, 60% of the community has dysentery from fecal coliform bacteria. The well pump is still sitting there, perfectly functional, except for a rare bearing nobody could make. In Timeline 61G, a group of 40 survivors includes a retired machinist with three decades of experience. Before the collapse, he operated CNC mills and lathes producing aerospace-grade components. 
on day 22, their diesel generator throws a rod through the engine block from bad fuel. He suggests they build a wood gas generator to run a smaller backup motor for essential systems. Wood gas generators work by heating wood in an oxygen-starved environment, producing combustible gases like carbon monoxide. They need a steel drum, some pipe, a filter system, and someone who can weld it together. The survivor never learned to weld because the factory had dedicated welders, and specialization was considered efficient. They attempt to bolt the components together using threaded pipe fittings and high-temperature sealant from a scavenged store. The connections leak gas under pressure, and the engine runs for 11 minutes before it dies. They have 500 acres of hardwood forest and no ability to convert it into mechanical energy. By day 106, their batteries are dead, their radios are silent, their security is blind. Wood seems simple until you need it to perform, and then it reveals its complexity instantly. Oak has a density of 0.75 grams per cubic centimeter and compressive strength of 6,000 PSI. Pine has a density of 0.43 and compressive strength of 4,800 PSI. If you build a load-bearing structure from pine and calculate using oak's properties, it collapses. Your great-grandfather knew which trees to cut in winter when the sap was down and moisture low. He could fell a tree with an ax and a wedge in under an hour. He could join two beams with a mortise and tenon that would hold for 200 years. You cannot identify wood species by grain or smell, and you own a cordless drill, period. In Timeline 88F, a prepared group has every modern convenience backed up in triplicate. They have three backup generators, 5,000 gallons of stabilized diesel, and comprehensive repair manuals. On day 64, all three generators fail simultaneously from a voltage spike that fried the electronic control modules. A survivor suggests they bypass the electronic controls and run the engines on purely mechanical governor systems. This requires machining new parts from scratch, flyweights, springs, linkage arms calibrated to specific RPM ranges. They have a manual lathe from the 1950s that weighs 800 pounds and works beautifully. But none of them have ever used a lathe, and the learning curve is measured in years. They attempt to machine a simple bushing, and the tool chatters, ruining the part and dulling the cutter. By day 130, they are burning wood in barrels for heat like medieval peasants. Their 5,000 gallons of diesel sits in tanks, chemically perfect, mechanically inaccessible, completely useless. A coal forge is a hole in the ground with air blown through it at controlled rates. With a forge, an anvil, and basic hammers, you can repair nearly any pre-electronic metal object. You can make knives and axes and chisels and hammers and springs and hinges and brackets. A functional forge requires three things, a heat source, forced air, and metallurgical knowledge from experience. The heat source can be coal or charcoal or even hardwood if the airflow is sufficient. The knowledge cannot be downloaded. It must be earned through burning your hands and ruining steel. When you heat steel past its critical temperature of around 1460 degrees, the crystal structure changes. If you work it below that temperature, you are just bending metal, not forging it properly. A skilled blacksmith can judge metal temperature by color, often within 50 degrees. In Timeline 45H, a survivor spent three years before the collapse learning blacksmithing. He worked weekends at a historical reenactment forge, making nails and hooks for tourists who barely noticed. He burned his arms, he ruined steel, he learned to read the metal's color and sound. When his community's water hand pump breaks on day 38, he knows what to do. He builds a forge from fire bricks and a salvaged hair dryer, powered by a small solar panel. He heats the broken pump lever to cherry red and forge welds a new section using borax flux. The repair takes six hours of heating and hammering and reheating in careful, deliberate cycles with focus. The pump works for another eight years, and he becomes the most valuable survivor in the community. He trains four apprentices, and they train others, and the knowledge spreads like a controlled fire. They trade tools for food with neighboring groups who have seeds but no way to work soil. The knowledge did not die because he refused to let it stay buried in the past. You cannot learn blacksmithing or timber framing or tool sharpening from a single video binge session. These are physical skills that require proprioceptive feedback. 
the feel of the hammer, the smell of burning. Start now, today, before you need it, when failure is just annoying instead of fatal to yourself. Buy a small anvil, build a brake drum forge, learn to make a simple nail from rebar. By Nail 100, you will understand heat and hammer blows and metal flow under stress. Learn to sharpen a chisel until it can shave the hair off your arm with a single stroke. Study metallurgy, even basic metallurgy, iron carbon phase diagrams, hardness testing, tempering temperatures and quenching mediums. Collect tools that do not require electricity, hand drills, brace and bit, hand saws, files, rasps. Survival is not about having things. It is about knowing how to make things from other things. A survivor with a forge and an anvil and knowledge can make weapons and tools indefinitely from scrap. The most valuable preps are not objects. They are neural pathways formed through thousands of hours of practice. The collapse will not erase the laws of physics or the properties of materials or thermodynamics. It will only erase the supply chains that let you ignore your ignorance of how things work. In 1850, 70% of the male population could perform basic blacksmithing and carpentry as needed. In 2026, less than 0.01% of the population can forge a usable knife. We traded individual capability for collective efficiency, and that trade only works when the collective is functioning. When the collective fails, you are left holding a dead smartphone and a fuel pump you cannot fix. Physics does not care about your prep budget, or your video subscriptions, or your good intentions at all. When your laser-cut titanium survival knife breaks, you will need someone who can forge a new one. That someone needs to be you, or someone you convinced to learn before it was too late. Learn to make fire hot enough to melt metal and shape it into tools that keep people alive. Learn to read materials the way your ancestors did, through touch and sound and observation and failure. Because in the end, survival belongs to the people who understood the materials, not the market.